lecture of our Ikigai page and lecture series. Um, today we have another special guest, Kimberly Jackson. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so Kimberly is a senior associate at Alberto and serves as managing director for Alberto's Miami studio. I heard um, you're here for the past few years. Correct, yeah. And in your role as both manager and mentor, she leads our post multidisciplinary teams throughout the life of a project from concept and design to construction administration. Kimberly has spent over 25 years managing projects at all scales. She brings design projects to life by developing strong relationships between our co and the larger project team of owners, consultants, vendors, and contractors. Prior to her work at Oroco, Kimberly was responsible for architectural design in a variety of typologies, including hospitality, retail, residential, and corporate interiors. She developed and maintained design and documentation standards for multiple international brands. Kimberly has also designed furniture, textiles, fixtures, and lighting products for national and international retailers. She studied architecture and visual arts at MIT, minoring in music, and holds a graduate degree in architecture from Georgia Tech. She's a registered architect and a founding board member of the Hospitality Diversity Action Council. And previously, she served on the AIA New York Diversity Plus Inclusion Council and was a core organizer for the Design as a Purpose Collective. So we are Honored to have Kimberly, and I don't know whether any of you have been to the Hard Rock Cafe uh, <laughs> and the Casino. Hopefully, not the Casino. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, there are some projects that our club has done, and uh, very impressive. So, today's lecture is called Beyond Trends A Timeless Approach to Design Through Hospitable Thinking. And I understand from Kimberly that hospitable thinking is a registered trademark that they developed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to first ask all of you to do a little exercise. Um, you don't have to share it. It's not going to be a test. Don't worry about it. But I want you to think of your favorite hospitality spot, whether it's a cafe, a restaurant, hotel lobby, um, sky bar, you know, anything. It could be anything. It could be a sports bar. But just think about your favorite spot to go. And while we're talking, think about why it's your favorite spot. Um, before we get going, I will give you a little bit of information about Avrico and me. <laughs> um, you did hear my bio, so I don't have to go too much more into that. But um, Avrico has been around for 23 years. Um, we have multiple disciplines under the Avroco world umbrella. Um, but we're really rooted in hospitality. That's what we do. Um, that's what we've done for 23 years. The partners basically all went to school together, university, um, got back together at, in New York and decided to build a restaurant. Uh, they were coming from a bunch of different disciplines. Two of them were architects. Two of them were art and art history majors. But they designed that restaurant. They threw in all their money, designed a restaurant, soups to nuts. They did all of the interiors. They did all the architecture. They did all the furniture. They did all the branding. They did all of the tabletop. They did everything. And this is really what started Avrico. Um, that restaurant went on to be a Michelin-starred restaurant. Um, so they were really proud. They started a started a team, and we kept it going. Um, the best part about that restaurant, I will say, that they threw in there was an art feature in the bathrooms. It was little hotel soaps branded with the name of the restaurant that were just piled high all the way up the walls for all of the guests to take. So that little bit of surprise and delight for the guests. Um, we have five global offices, 23 years again, but we've got 200 plus employees around the world. Um, 40 plus cities that we have projects in. 
and we're growing. We're still growing. Miami being the newest studio, um, as you heard, we've been here for just under two years, about a year and a half. Um, and we're growing. Um, looking forward to maybe seeing some of you guys at some point in time. Uh, we live hospitality. This is what we do. Um, after that first restaurant that the partners opened, they went on to start more brands, uh, open more restaurants. And so these were all of the brands that they started in-house. Um, the ones that are still around, Ghost Donkey, Denver, Ghost Donkey, Las Vegas, Ghost Donkey, Phoenix. Um, they are all active. So if you're in any of those cities, go stop by. And the rest of what we do, aside from restaurants, we do hotels, food halls. We also do product, which we'll get into in a second. Workspaces, retail, residential, resorts, anything that we say is hospitality, we kind of do it. Avroco World has four divisions. The one you'll be hearing most about today is Avroco Interiors. That's what I do. Um, that's really our interior design studio. It does cover all five global offices. But we do also have Brand Bureau, which does brand development experience strategy, as well as experience design interiors. We have Avroco Hospitality Group, Africa Hospitality Group ran all of the restaurants, um, but they also do consulting for restaurant operations, um, anything from deciding uh, menu planning or even just programming, menu programming. Um, they also do everything from tabletop to uniforms. Um, they'll recommend those as well. Lastly, we've got Good Shop. We have our own manufacturing arm that manufactures our furniture and lighting, um, which is really wonderful, I must say, um, since we do design a lot of furniture and lighting in our uh, interiors team. But Good Shop will go and get it manufactured for us. We also have a couple of lines, product lines with Good Shop um, with Stella Works and a couple other people. There is one other division that's kind of a, just getting its legs under it that I did want to mention that's not on here. And uh, that is uh, Hospitable Bridge. Hospitable Bridge is uh, kind of the brainchild of our, one of our founding members, uh, Christina O'Neill. And what we do there is we provide micro grants to women of color who are entrepreneurs in the hospitality sphere. Um, so that's something else that we've been doing recently. Um, so with all of that said, you know, we create and evolve concepts. We visualize identities through Brand Bureau. We craft environments, both with interiors and with good shop manufacturing. And we execute and implement through our hospitality group. We're very, very detail-oriented, as you'll see in some of the slides coming up. Um, like I mentioned, we make our own custom furniture and lighting. And we also really like to dive into art features. Uh, it's something that we take pride in, kind of like the little soaps that I mentioned earlier. So I wanted to just walk through a project before we get into hospitable thinking. Uh, give you a little bit of an idea of how we walk through the process. <laughs> and um, then we'll take a look at it again with the lens of hospitable thinking, which I will go into what that's about in a minute. So Single Thread, it's a restaurant in Healdsburg, California, out in wine country. And it is the, the brainchild of two uh, married couple uh, who both have had experience in Japan, had come back to the States, and really wanted to open this amazingly immersive, um, kind of uh, uh, grounded restaurant. Katina is farming, and she has a big plot there that they actually farm a lot of their food from. And uh, Kyle is the chef. And he's a little bit more than a chef. He actually is kind of very experimental. Um, he really considers the kitchen his laboratory. And so we took off on those ideas and those concepts. And what we like to do is, I know you guys are used to the idea of having a concept 
before you go into design. <laughs> um, we have three, minimum. Um, we like to use a multi-layered narrative so that we can kind of pull the strings of each of these pieces, and dial up or dial down as we move from space to space. And it also gives us the opportunity to dive deeper and kind of pull out details, um, pull out different features that really make our project sing. So here's the entry you can see into the kitchen right as you enter into the laboratory. Um, there is an open kitchen plan. This is just a piece of it. Uh, one of the things, one of the concept pieces of the concept narrative for this space is the workshop. And a lot of it is also based on the intersection of science and nature. One of the things that this team did, this was done out of our California, San Francisco office, they really leaned into Fibonacci and the golden rectangle. So here, we've got a front door that's based on golden ratio. Um, it also has, as you can see, hints of the Japanese um, mending. And then here as well, the screens that you see are also based on golden rectangle. We've got um, some tile patterns in the kitchen that have a Fibonacci sequence. Um, they're just little bits and pieces that come into play in the design. Uh, the furniture here was made by our good shop manufacturing arm. Uh, we also do have this um, as part of a line through Stellar Works. Um, and here you can see the millwork. Here I'm going to use the pointer. The millwork pieces here, these trays hold the cutlery. And this is a multi, multi <laughs> um, seat meal. And so each of these trays represents one of the courses of your meal. So as you're eating, you're actually seeing how you're progressing through the meal as part of the interaction of the space. This is a view into the kitchen. And um, one of the other things that was part of the concept narrative was the idea of craftsmanship. And so they actually made all of these pots that are used actually during the course of the meal um, for the restaurant specifically. Another instance of an art feature being this here, which is clay tiles pulled from the site and fired at different temperatures and for different durations and turned into a gradient. It's all the same dirt. <laughs> Beautiful bathroom. However, this is a spacer used in kilns and we made hardware from it. And of course, there's an inn upstairs, so you know you have a 10-course meal. You're going to get tired. And one other lovely thing here is our brand bureau studio fabricated, created, designed these menus, um, which you can take with you at the end of your meal. That's just a shot from the outside. A little bit more reference to science and nature. So now that you've seen one project, let's talk about hospitable thinking. So our partners got together, and they have a summit every year. And they really wanted to think about how to, how to best serve the guests. You know, as a designer, we're a little bit removed from that. You know, we try as we can to plan for our guest journeys, um, to really design for the end user. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, we're a bit removed. There's a lot of steps in between. We're not necessarily always there when the users are there. Um, so how can we, aside from our just our standard kind of design trends and things like that, how can we really plan for the users of our space? So they really, they went back, they went back to kind of bare bones and they really wanted to come up with some core truths 
about how people interact with spaces and what would really affect them. They came up with four. First one being security. This isn't necessarily kind of locks and bolts security. This is how do you feel in the space? Are you comfortable? Are you anxious? Are you nervous? Um, you know, do you feel safe? And that can come in many, many different forms depending on the person. Um, I know when I've got my, you know, a lot of people, when you get your back to the door and there's a lot of people moving back and forth behind you, you're not really secure, you're a little bit uncomfortable. Um, or even when you, know, you get sat and you're kind of near the kitchen and there's just a lot of noise and you, you aren't really having that conversation, it's a little uncomfortable. And so really, how can we make our guests feel secure, safe, protected? Um, and like I said, that comes in a lot of different ways. Second, surprise. We really want to make sure there's an element of surprise somewhere in our design. We want people to be surprised, delighted, have some joy in the space that they're in. And this all can come from design, but there are also other methods. There's also the operations team. There's also the food team. There, there are little pieces that can come together to provide these, these senses of security and surprise. Three is significance. We want the guests to feel that they are just their basic needs are met. You know, they want to feel unique. They want to feel special. They want to come into a space. They don't want to be ignored. Um, so how can we do that through design? You know, what is the process of design and how do we get there? And the last one, synergy. It's about pulling all of the pieces together, making the whole greater than the sum of the parts. For me, that is pulling the design with the operations, with the ownership team, with the front of house team, with the back of house team. How do all of these things work together to flow to service the guest? This is where the partners started. When they were thinking about it, they were thinking about, well, security, spaces that work, safe and secure tech. You want to be able to swipe your card and not worry about it. Uh, dining offerings that you can count on. Is it the same meal? Is it something different every single time, but you're not quite sure how different? Is it um, just in a hotel, just being able to have a good night's sleep without worrying about anything? Surprise, it can be things just like having coffee delivered to your door unexpectedly. Um, you know, being able to go up to the rooftop and actually see that sunset. Significance, making people feel that they're local, that they're welcome. And then synergy, as mentioned, when all parts come together and provide an exceptional and memorable experience for your guests. So I'm gonna go back to single thread for a second and uh, talk about a little bit more about this restaurant in terms of hospitable thinking. When you first enter Single Thread, you're coming to this room. It's the vestibule. It's kind of your host stand, except it's warm, it's spacious, it's inviting. The person that's going to greet you is probably going to be Katina, the owner. The person who's going to come and say hi to you through the window, that's probably going to be Kyle. <laughs> and so they are right there. They are there. They are greeting you. This is where they take your coat. They give you your personal menu because they've already taken your menu preferences. And you know, this is operations. However, we needed to provide a space for them to do that. We needed to make a space that was inviting so that they, the operators, could really serve their guests. You walk through the door on the left, and you've got these intimate spaces. These screens actually divide three different seating areas, yet they're not opaque. You can see through them. You know that there's people over there. It's not that big of a restaurant. It's maybe, maybe about 50 seats. Um, 
but you feel that you have your own space. It's not crowded. There are not um, tons of open tables around. Um, there's a lot of comfort in being able to be enveloped with a banquette uh, without having servers bumping into you. And so these are things that we think about when we are actually designing the space. Same thing here. This is a very well protected banquette. I actually have sat in this back room and it's not really the back room. Uh, it's comfortable, it's warm, it's welcoming, it has its own vibe. And of course, having a place where your guests feel comfortable, it's calming, it's soothing. After a big dinner and you just want to be comfortable and this is where you would go. And for the bit of surprise here, the menu that our brand bureau did, you get this flower, you get a personal hand note from Kyle and Katina, but this pouch actually contains seeds. So everybody gets a pack of seeds to take with them as a memory of their time at this restaurant that's based around a farm. We can go through a couple of other projects that I'd like to, but actually I'm gonna back up because I forgot a couple of things to mention. Surprise. These screens not only are the heights and width based on golden ratio, but as you see over here, there's, they're hand woven by the way, by a fabric artist. And these are DNA patterns of flowers and plants from around the farm. All of the servers know the history and the, um, the design of the space. And they make sure that their guests feel comfortable and learn something and are surprised and are just have a bit of delight in their surroundings because you're in there for about two plus hours. Um, and that's another part of operations that coincides with design. Has everybody thought of their favorite place yet? <laughs> I'm gonna go through one more and then I'm gonna see. So this is Rosewood, Bangkok. It opened um, probably 2020. And um, one of the really great things here is all of these really wonderful elements, like this light fixture. The basis of design in this one, and I'm gonna have to look up, because I do not want to mess up this story, <laughs> but it is the story of the weaver girl and the cowherd. It's a lyrical Chinese folklore. And the weaver girl is from heaven and she comes down and falls in love with the cowherd. Her mom says, no way, <laughs> get back up there. But once a year, you can come down and visit. And so the folklore goes that she comes down on a bridge of magpies. And so we use this folklore throughout the design of the space. And this is the entrance. So this is our kind of element of surprise and delight right as you enter the hotel. There are also small elements that don't seem too substantial until you really think about it. This is you know, just your six top round kind of in the middle, but it's made very significant by this light feature that's right above it. It's a really prominent space. I also like moves like this that are intimate bar table dining 
where you have that one-on-one -on -one connection with the bartender. That's not a service bar. That bartender is there serving those people right there for you. When you go up to the top floor, there's a record bar, a little bit of a private dining room in the middle, um, listening lounge bar. Um, they do play records. But there's this door here that leads to this. These types of moves here, you've got these little two top banquettes, which just provides those intimate moments with you and whoever you're with, giving you a sense of security because you're kind of to the side, that intimacy, that safety. And of course, you've got your surprise and delight. One, you came through a record, record store. Uh, two, you're sitting at the top of Bangkok. Here? Yeah, they can. Um, there is another area. Let me see if I brought the slide in here. There's another area here that there can be a DJ. Great. What about the staircase? This. <laughs> um, element of surprise. Yeah. It is <laughs> surprise. <laughs> but you know, you're not really going up there. But. Um, <laughs> but it is an element of surprise. It, I, I think, um, you know, I'd have to actually go up there myself. I haven't been there. Uh, but again, the idea of having these little tucked away nooks where you can feel safe, um, you can feel significant because you are there. You are, you're being, you feel like you're being taken care of. And of course, you've got your surprise elements left and right with this project. I love this project. <laughs> a little bit more. These lights were designed uh, by our furniture and lighting team at Good Shop uh, to reflect the platters of the albums. And then Perry Lane. So I'm going to stop here for a second. Anybody want to share their favorite place? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah? Mine's actually like a listening bar. A listening bar? Yeah, like you just showed us. What makes it your favorite? I uh, love music, love vinyl, um, I love the acoustics, I love always a certain type of material like the rich woods, um, the dim lighting, the mystery. Do any of the hospitable thinking, we call them the four S's, resonate with your favorite place? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? yeah. Anybody else? Uh, mine is Fountain Blue, Miami. Mm -hmm. um, one of the hospitable thinking is security. So they have two separate like, buildings for people own those. And they also have like their own Fountain Blue Beach. So it's separate from the Very secure in that sense. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Any, I saw I saw a hand on this side. Anybody? <laughs> no? I was just gonna say that I mean Pauli is the lobby of a hotel. Mm. I know I Pauli because depending on the, the sign of the lobby, I would probably determine my stay, like the surprise or that gonna take care of me, walk me. Like I don't know, it's kinda of more like a fantasy, like how is it gonna be there? Yeah. That is a great segue into Perry Lane, actually. <laughs> Thank you. So Perry Lane is a boutique hotel. Actually, it's not quite boutique, but um, it's a hotel in Savannah, Georgia. I don't know if anybody, if you've, any of you have been, but um, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Perry Lane, I, I want to give you guys, as you take a look, the, the, the narrative behind Perry Lane, which one, you know, Savannah has a very unique urban plan with their parks and the streets and the parks and the alleys. And we kind of did a little bit of that here in the interior planning. We've got some spaces that open up 
and spaces that are like kind of linear and narrow. The other one that they wanted to overlay here is the sense of tradition and ritual. The third being the peacock at the party. So that flashy person who's at the party. So here you can see a little bit of the tradition and ritual in the detailing. It's a modernized kind of uh, contemporary idea of traditional woodwork, uh, but it's still there. It resonates. And you can see a little bit of flash of the peacock at the party here. Now this is one of the lobbies and um, one of the libraries. What's fascinating about Perry Lane is a lot of the surprise elements. If you dare, which a lot of people don't, I'm going to go back one. You've all, we've all seen millwork in hotels, and we don't really touch it. But this one, if you do, you get a little bit of a surprise. And these artifacts were collected from around Savannah um, and are part of the art features that we have here. And here's where one of those areas that kind of opens up. It's a little bit more of a gathering spot before it narrows back down and tightens back up. What I love about this project is the, what we call the muse, the peacock at the party, and all of the splashes of color that are coming in and overlaying on top of that kind of traditional and ritual, as you can see here. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> and this is again one of those narrow, kind of narrow alleys that we kind of we put in the plan. And again, we really do still want a warm, inviting, calm, soothing guest room. And they did a really great job. This was out of our New York office. They did a really great job of contemporizing the traditional moldings. <laughs> Did I spark anybody else's interest to share? Favorite place? Yeah, favorite place. Favorite place I went to is the Museum Hotel in Cappadocia. Hmm. No, that's great. And, and yeah, it, it dovetails right into this and surprise and delight, 100%. Astor Hall is a food hall in Chicago that looks over Lake Michigan. Their, their kind of guiding star narrative the, one of them was the arcade architecture. And so they did set up this linear kind of thoroughfares um, and views throughout, um, uninterrupted, very layered, but uninterrupted views throughout. Yet for me, and like ev it's different for everybody, but for me, even though you're in the middle, these chairs envelop you and keep you protected. And again, having these intimate little nooks where you also feel protected and out of the way. Surprise. There are others in this uh, seating group. Some of them are uh, junior vice president. One of them was, wait, I wrote it, oh, social um, influencer. And the other one was co-pilot. Those are the ones that I thought were the fanciest. So choose your own seat wisely. Uh, 
I also thought this was interesting in giving each individual their own little moment and being a moment of significance. And Zuzu's. Is this all resonating? You guys yeah. feeling the four S's? <laughs> Zuzu's is a restaurant in New York City, uh, in the Pendry Hotel. And um, this opened 2021, 22. So it's very new. And it also has the same elements that I've been kind of, I've been pushing and talking about all in a little bit of a different manner. They're all mixed a little different ways. Again, you've got this nice little cozy bar. As you can see here. And here, this is your entry moment. This is where you walk in the door, you're greeted by the host, and again, you have this moment of respite. You can kind of shake off whatever is going outside. It's New York City, you gotta shake off whatever's going on outside. And um, you get to pause before you go and have your experience. And hopefully, your experience will be one of surprise and delight. The back wall here is a mural. Um, I, sh I should have mentioned Zuzu's, one of the one of the concept narratives in Zuzu's is a, an area in um, the Near East. Um, it's the area that's considered now Turkey, um, Syria, Israel, Jordan, um, that area. Um, the designer is from that area. It's also a Middle Eastern restaurant. Um, and she designed this art feature as a mural to look like the worn rugs in a mosque. Ouija Mi is another restaurant in New York City. And what's really special about this one is that it's a Korean restaurant. The owner is Korean and he had a previous restaurant and he wanted he said he wanted a Michelin star. I don't know how many owners come up to us and say that, but yeah, that was his goal. Um, it was interesting because we had um, two of our teammates were also from Korea and they really, really wanted to work on this. We're like, let's do it. And so the details in here one of them is based on hairpins from Korea, this light fixture. They based a lot of the millwork detailing on traditional Korean design. And they still had, end up with these really cozy, intimate moments, which you'll see in a second, where you're protected from the flow of whatever is coming on over here. And this is actually the omakase that's behind it. It's in the same, in the same area. And of course, omakase in general gives you that sense of significance. But they really made this especially cozy in paying attention to the lighting, designing really beautiful elements that accentuate something that you can't get rid of, a column, <laughs> um, and just making sure that everything was just right. Yes, please. Um, make it happen. So what do you do like, in the design, like, throughout the design process? Like, 
designing a restaurant for someone who in their mind is like, I want the best of the best. Like, does that Michelin mindset kind of like, how do you like even begin to design for that? Like, does it take into account with design when like the Michelin person comes in and like reviews the operations in the restaurant and the food and the menu and like everything that's going on at once? So does all of that encompass like what it takes to get a Michelin star? All of it is. It is. Um, we, are, we can't solely do that for anybody, <laughs> which is kind of why I was joking about it a little bit. We do our best to provide them with the absolute best design that we can. And we are going to always do that for our clients. Um, they do have to bring a little bit, too. They've got to have the chef. They've got to have the operations. They've got to have everything else that goes along with it. Um, but when it all comes together, synergy, talk about how your education um, with the MFA has complemented ah. your, um, you as a designer in the projects that you work on. Oh, interesting. Um, I don't think you've put that in your bio. <laughs> but, oh, did you? You had the MFA in there? Um, I, I did go to the museum school um, just for a, a small bit. Um, I was actually doing video art alongside architecture as an undergrad. And so that's what I, I was doing. Um, it wasn't a master's degree. I was just at the Museum School of Fine Arts in Boston. Okay. Um, however, because I was doing video art, I did study art as well. And I think really it was the intersection of me doing architecture, which I decided at 12 I wanted to be an architect. Um, and really going through this kind of discovery of design, art and design that led me to actually kind of take a shift into interiors um, instead of staying with kind of base building architecture. So it did have, it did have an influence, I, I will say. Mm -hmm. Hi. I'm curious about the, the four S's and just the whole hospitable thinking concept. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Um, so it actually started before COVID. The partners really were starting to talk about it, I want to say about 2018-ish. Um, and it has developed since. Um, there were uh, several you know, iterations. Um, I think the first three S's have always been. Um, and then there was a little bit of uh, a shift in that fourth S uh, to really make it sing. I think when they come together, when those four come together, um, just things, powerful things come out of their minds. And um, that's really where this, this came about. Um, they enjoy taking deep dives into design, design thinking, um, the psychology in design, um, you know, making the guests uh, journey the best that it can be. It's all about being hospitable. Um, it's part, it's not just hospitable thinking, it's us as people being hospitable to each other. And so that's really what it comes down to. And the second question on the topic of that is, do you, did you find maybe, because some of your examples came out in 2021, mm -hmm. 2022, so that's obviously right in the middle of that, obviously in development long before that, but as that process went on, did you find as a team you were designing with maybe more security in mind and that's sort of like what your you know clients and owners were desiring more just to get it open or like how are you always trying to keep everything in balance and perfect balance or do you really tailor maybe one s more than another you know to to the specific site and everything now i think it it, it kind of a, a bit of it comes organically we have these in the back of our heads this is really what we need to do to enhance our guests. Um, the design process happens, but as we are reviewing it, as we are looking at it, we have been doing this for so long that we are, you know, we kind of like, no, that's too exposed. We don't need that over there. You know, this is, and you start to develop those instincts on 
how these four S's fit into the design and how to design with them without really having to kind of dial them up or down. Um, but that's a really great question. It really is. Um, please. How do you deal with universal design? I noticed that you have different projects in different cities, different mm -hmm. uh, countries, and we have different uh, uh, codes, regulations, Absolutely. standards. How do you deal with that? Because you talk about security of your guests, mm -hmm. and I see in some of your projects that, for example, ADA is not taken into account. And probably it's because if it's in another country, and how you manage that, that, that did you, like, for, for the rest of the people that is not in the US, you suggest them to, like, be more in that universal design, or how that works? So I think all of our studios are aware of their local accessibility regulations. We definitely, for me, Personally, that is part of security. It is part of significance um, to make sure that we're designing for everybody. Um, some of the things that you see, you might not notice that they are accessible. Um, we've been designing things with cranks these days. We've got a couple of restaurants going up in St. Petersburg that actually the, the bar looks like it's not accessible, but the whole side of it lowers. Um, so there are, there are a lot of different ways to take in accessibility into account. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that may not come out in the photos, but they're there. We definitely want to make sure that we're aware of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big proponent of that, yes. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Please. Thank you, wonderful presentation. I'm sure the, the ambiance doesn't make justice, right? The, the photographs don't make justice to being there. Um, one question I had was, how do you work? Can you give us some insights into how you work with Brand Bureau uh, to kind of seamlessly go from branding to design? Can you give us some? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to go back to, let me actually. I'm going to flip back a bit here and go back to single thread again. Um, they actually did work for Perry Lane as well. Um, they've done work for a lot of our, a lot of our spaces. So Brand Bureau, they, they do have their own projects. We don't work with them hand in hand on every project that we each do. But um, we do recommend them when our clients ask for branding signage, um, graphics, things like that. And how we work is basically um, depending on whose team is the lead. Um, if it's us, we will start with our concept narrative and our, our storyline. And um, as we're moving through, they will come on and join us. They will be looped into that storyline and they will start developing their information in tandem with us. Um, we don't necessarily design to each other, but we do take into account our clients' needs, the storyline, the overarching storyline, and we want to make sure that there is synergy between the two elements. We sit in on their meetings, they sit in on our meetings, we comment on each other's progress in the background. You know? <laughs> um, we, we really do work hand in hand as kind of sibling companies. Mm -hmm, please. Mm. Um, you know, our studio is incredibly collaborative. Um, we have, I mean, we've got everybody from interns to me, managing director, and everything in between. Um, but we work fairly flat. Um, everybody comes in with, des with design ideas. Um, some of the best ideas have come from our interns. And we're like, oh, yeah, let's go with it. You know, that's how we work. We want to have our teams working. Um, hand in hand with each other. Um, we don't really like top down. And so when we're looking for people, we want people who have that collaborative spirit, who 
aren't afraid to kind of put their ideas out there, even if they're a little tentative, um, which, you know, everybody's a little tentative at, at times, you know, but throw it out there. We want to hear your ideas. Um, so just kind of we look for people who want to take that leap and are, are kind of ready to go. <laughs> sense that uh, is there a particular design skill you need to practice as compared to healthcare, education, and things that you've been doing? You know, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that did not come out in my bio, um, and that comes up a lot in just talking to people in various studios, and I'm sure a lot of you guys here probably even have this. Um, it, most people have worked in hospitality at some point in time, whether they worked at a McDonald's in high school, or I, I worked at a hotel in high school. Um, my dad actually was into, had fast casual restaurants, so I worked in those. So I, you've got that understanding of what hospitality is. I think, um, and just actually being a consumer of hospitality, you know what you are looking for. Um, but you also know how to provide that to the future guest. And I think that's not so different than somebody who's working in retail, um, who may have worked in retail in high school, or somebody who's worked in healthcare. They might have been a candy striper or something in healthcare. Um, there's a little bit of that background that you're like, oh, you know, I, I remember how to do this, and I remember what it was like. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily unique. Um, we've got people who've been bartenders, you know, that, things like that. They know a little bit of operations. They know how big a bar might need to be to make it easy for them to work. Um, but just little things like that are, are kind of fun to have, knowledge in your back pocket. But it's not necessary, I don't think. You learn. You learn. Any last We do workshops. Um, we do very specific and targeted workshops with our clients. Sorry, I'm going to get a little bit of water. Um, and it's early on. Um, we'll do a kickoff workshop. We'll come in with some imagery. We'll have a bunch of different things. And, we're, and sometimes it's a bunch of cards on the table of images. And we're like, pick 10 things you like, just to get an idea. Not that we're going to design that, but just to get an idea of where you're leaning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but that's when we start asking the questions. And we keep asking the questions until we kind of get that information. are always challenges. I think that um, one of the ones that was particularly difficult was that every once in a while, it's just not a right fit. And you try and you try, and you do your best for the client. And the client tries too. But just every once in a while, it's not very frequently. It's just not a good fit. And to recognize when it's not a good fit is one of the hardest challenges. Yes, please. Yeah, along with that. Mm -hmm. do the workshop, as we say. Um, you usually can get most of the information you need out of that. If you're still not clear, 
you do a little bit more digging. And it's, it's kind of experience to know what to dig for and what questions to ask to pull out the information from the client. <clears throat> and if the client is kind of over there in their thinking and what they need, again, they might not be the right fit for us if we're over here. But you usually can figure that out at the very beginning. Um, clients will typically come to a design firm because they know the work of the design firm. They've, they've done their research as well. Um, so it's not that frequent when you just are kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum. Um, it's a, it doesn't happen that too often. And we can usually figure that out um, even before you've signed a contract or anything like that. <laughs> Souvenir to Kimberly oh. for being here. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> oh.